Is an undiscovered planet X on course to destroy the Earth? What happens if you take the red pill and the blue pill at the same damn time? Answers to these questions and more on this episode of This of Paranormal, Paranormal Life. Life. Hey. Welcome back to the podcast. It is Tuesday once again. You are listening to your favorite paranormal investigators in the whole wide world. That's I am joined by professional paranormal investigator, Mr. Rory Pars. How are you doing, everyone out there in the paranormal nation? And my name is Kit Greer. Red pill, blue blue pill. That was a good uh, intro question. I don't know how it works. Well, when he took uh, the red pill, right? That's the one that makes everything go mad. Maybe Morpheus was just like giving him the illusion of a of a choice. Yeah, they're both red pills. Yeah, they're both. Yeah. <laughs> He just opened them up beforehand, emptied out the blue pill, yeah. filled it up with some of that red pill juice. And you're like, you know what? You're like, Morpheus, I really appreciate the choice. I'm sorry, man. I'm going to go blue pill. And he's like, all right, listen, it's fine. <laughs> you know, one in three people take the blue pill. There's no shame in that. You're like, okay, have a good night, man. You know, you go home that night, go to bed, wake up in the morning, <laughs> goo pod, like <laughs> shaved head. And Morpheus is just over your pod, just going, welcome to the real world, motherfucker. <laughs> You're like, God damn it, Morpheus. <laughs> I wanted to seem like a chill guy, but uh, <laughs> we really need you. You can't do that. That's really unfair. And he's like, how the f*** do you think I got here? <laughs> <laughs> I took that blue pill and ran for the hills, but uh-oh. <laughs> Dorpheus gave me two reds. <laughs> Dorpheus. This is suddenly very much like someone trying to pass a curse along. Yeah, it is. Totally. <laughs> oh, as always, we're just going to dive right into today's story. Kaploosh. It's the 1500s, and French settlers have reached North America for the first time. Chill. Claiming va- it wasn't chill. Claiming vast swathes of land. They nice. had let... They had, <laughs> fine. I guess it is nice for them. Good for them. Yeah, they get a bunch of free land. <laughs> it wasn't free. There was a lot of blood spilt, actually. A lot of blood paid for that land. A lot of wine spilt. Partying over that free land. They just ganked. It's Independence Day. <laughs> right now i'm excited all right (laughs) (laughs) they had left the relative safety of europe behind and entered the unknown not only did they face dangers from both man and nature but they soon realized they faced paranormal dangers too in what we would call minnesota today the chippewa people were living in total famine with no food they risked certain death if they couldn't make it through winter Except, rather than hide and conserve their energy, or forage for anything they could find, they gathered. They gathered on the edge. I thought you were going to say they gathered berries and nuts. No. No. They huddled together. They gathered on the edge of Lake Windingo. (laughs) Fuck, I f***ed it up already. (laughs) They gathered gathered on the edge of Lake Bigfoot. (laughs) Fuck, I wasn't supposed to tell you the goddamn premise. (laughs) They gathered... (laughs) On the edge of Lake Windigo. <laughs> Near- oh, I wonder what this one's about. <laughs> Silence! Near- Jesus Christ. Lake Windigo, near Star Island. Under the stars, they beat drums and danced backwards. They called this, and I apologize to any First Nations people out there who, who will critique my pronunciation, but something along the lines of Windingu Kanzimun. I assume this is their version of some sort of cha-cha slide. How very dare you. That's the dance of my people. How dare you, sir? <laughs> I mean, if you want to be a oaf about it, then sure. sure. <laughs> you seem happy with that. Absolutely. <laughs> it's an oral culture. Uh, it's a culture of song, of dance. That is the way that they express themselves. They didn't have TVs, movie cameras. You know, they're, uh, d- listen, the Ridley Scott's of the First Nations people, they were out there making the Alien 2 of dance moves. Via movement. Yes. That's pretty badass. I can respect that. They performed this dance for their own safety because they knew from generations and generations of living in the wilderness that out there, there was something worse than starvation, worse than death, a paranormal beast. Wow. The settlers could have thought these people were crazy, But they saw this same ritual across multiple regions of North America with all different tribes. In fact, one of the largest existing tribes of First Nations people, the Cree, also practiced this. Tribes spoke of the Wendigo, or the evil spirit that devours mankind. Right. Wendigo for short. 
So I assume these people, you know, similar to how some cultures have like a rain dance. Mm -hmm. This is their like battle dance. Yeah. Or their defense dance. Yeah. Back off, Wendigo. Get yeah. These sweet ass moves. Yeah. If you come at me, I'll slide to the left, slide to the right. Oh, you're going to try and get my legs? Crisscross, <laughs> motherfucker. Crisscross. <laughs> I like dance and I like combat. So the merging of those two activities is a big A plus in my book. It's like Mo Sislak's break dancing for self defense class in That's The Simpsons. Right. This is why you are not. If some Wendingo is dissing your fly girl, you got to give him one of those. This is why you're not invited to many dances. In right. Fact. Too intense. You're, <laughs> you're mostly invited to brunches, lunches, things that you can't dance at. Right. Strictly no nighttime affairs. Nothing with music. I was described on Britain's Got Talent as quote unquote too sexual. And if they can't handle that, then maybe that's not the type of show I should be on. And you say it was Britain's Got Talent, but it was actually Pornhub UK's Got Talent. talent so I don't yeah. know how it was too sexual. It was called Casting Couch. And I, I think I nailed it, actually. Yeah, we take Rory out for borderline coffee. And if, if anything with a half decent beat comes on, he starts swinging. Even that's if they're really just using awful. the machines to a rhythm. Yeah. You know, I'll, I, I feel Anyone that. tapping their feet, he sees red. Yeah. <laughs> It's not so much as a dance is like a fury. Yeah. I just, you know, like any good danceman, Michael Jackson-esque, grab the nearest weapon and start flailing it around. You ever heard of the rhythm of the night? This is the rhythm of the fight. <laughs> this is the rhythm of the fight. <laughs> <laughs> this is playing the background as two bouncers hold each arm and one bouncer's punching you in the stomach. <laughs> I drop my katana. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, the Wendigo, a beast possessing supernatural power. As tall as 15 foot, part man, part beast, with horrifying skin stretched barely across its gaunt figure. Oh. So bloodthirsty, it has eaten its own lips. Oh. Just teeth and skin remaining. It stalks its prey. It can mimic human voices to lead people into the dark. All it wants is human meat. Yet its hunger is never satisfied. The more it feeds, the larger it becomes. The older it gets, the more power it accrues. Ancient Wendigo are said to be able to control the weather itself, creating darkness during daytime. This is like when you're playing a game as a kid and you, you're all making up your own superheroes and there's that one kid that gives himself every power and he's like, yeah, I can control the weather, I eat humans and as I get older, I grow stronger. And it's like... <laughs> David, don't be a dickhead. Like, Chris can fly. I've got laser eyes. Pick one power. And he's like, nope. <laughs> and that's Mr. Wendingo to you. <laughs> one of the other kids is like, okay, I grab you by the lips and uh, punch you in the face. Oh, no lips. Add him <laughs> off already. No lips. Add him off already because I'm such a beast and I didn't feel it at all. <laughs> you know, that's the most weakly asthmatic kid as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've also got my own freaking lake. That's Wendingo HQ. I would like to specify, it's actually, so the, <laughs> they are scared of the Wendigo and they hang out at Windigo Lake. Right. Two very separate words. Unrelated. And it doesn't just stalk and kill. The Wendigo can infect the mind of an individual, causing them to suffer endless nightmares until they can no longer sleep and lose their sanity altogether. They say that it starts with smells that no one else notices. Uh, you guys, uh, I, smell some, I, smell, I smell some cooking. You guys smell it? Nah, 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 I don't smell it. Mm, weird. I guess you guys must be stuffed up. Oh, Wendigo. That's, that's disturbing. Before long, you're insane. Running straight into the woods, into the clutches of the Wendigo. Too many powers. This thing has too many powers. It's confusing me. That's why Goatman has scary. a hatchet. That's not even a power. <laughs> You know, and he ran with what God gave him. Exactly. Oh, you're like, oh, by the way, Wendigo, two hatchets. <laughs> and nunchucks. He actually has a second thumb on each hand so he can handle even more hatchets. This yeah. is kind of like a Swiss army thumb. The goat man is very much the Batman of the cryptid world. He's kind of like Absolutely. the, he's the most badass because he doesn't even have any powers. Yeah. He's just rich and has gadgets. <laughs> And the goat man is very rich from <laughs> robbing and killing hicks. 
The goat man just shows up and he's like, I'm going to stop the enemy with my goat orang. That's a hatchet. <laughs> it doesn't so much come back as they die and I retrieve it from their corpse. And we actually have a disturbing written record from as early as the 1600s from a French Jesuit publication describing the possession by Wendigo. In 1661, Jesuit relations reported... What caused us greater concern was the intelligence that met us upon entering the lake, namely that men deputed by our conductor. This is written in very 1600s language. Also, this is very rambly. If you <laughs> show up and you saw the Wendigo, the letter would be very different. It would read a little bit like this: "Fucking hell, beast, beast. <laughs> Does anyone smell toast? Ah!" Also, the soundtrack to Steph Curry sinking another three. <laughs> he is unstoppable! <laughs> <laughs> it does really sound like his sports coverage. <laughs> Could you imagine if there was a, 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 like a basketball player called Wendingo? <laughs> you would be so goddamn scared. <laughs> 15 foot of muscle and no lips. <laughs> It's going to be a great game today. We're really excited to see all the players on the field. Of course, we have the Wendingo <laughs> subbing in for LeBron in the second <laughs> half. Yes, he's just about the oldest player to play uh, professionally in the NBA. But of course, as he grows stronger as he ages, <laughs> he has the power of, of three men. <laughs> That's right, Trent. He kind of bucks the trend for older players typically leaving the game as they age. As you can see, he's now enjoying a halftime snack, just enjoying some human flesh there, which will really keep those energy levels up for that last quarter. Of course, that's really going to reinvigorate him in the second half, uh, which he's been playing exceptionally well. Dunking from about the uh, mid-court. <laughs> Feats that were only thought possible through the works of the popular film Space Jam are now brought to life in front of us. <laughs> These men had met their death the previous winter in a very strange manner. These poor men, according to the report given us, were seized with an ailment unknown to us, but not very unusual among the <laughs> German now. <laughs> not very unusual among the people we were seeking. They are afflicted with neither lunacy, hypochondria, nor frenzy, but have a combination of all these species of disease which affects their imaginations and causes them a more than canine hunger. It makes them so ravenous for human flesh that they pounce upon women, children, and even upon men like veritable werewolves and devour them voraciously without being able to appease or glut their appetite, ever seeking fresh prey. And the more greedily, the more they eat. It's a lot of words to say that people have gone mad. <laughs> well... It got pretty hot and heavy around the middle there. I think they mentioned lunacy, hypochondria, and frenzy. Uh, ravenous for human flesh, pouncing upon women, children, and men, eating like werewolves, devouring them, uh, completely unable to appease their appetite, ever seeking fresh prey, uh, and eating more and more the more they eat. It's a damn good Friday. <laughs> so needless to say, the colonization of North America was going swimmingly. Of course. Just <laughs> this, as planned. This was a Christian magazine, just to remind you. Now, of course, physical evidence going back to the 1600s is always going to be rare. But we do have this claw. <laughs> I have the earliest known NBA records. We have a what, <laughs> entire team of Wendigos dunking man, woman, and child <laughs> through some very primitive nets. Like the f***ing monsters. A whole team of Wendigos. Dude, if we do not start selling <laughs> Wendigo jerseys, like that is a missed off right there. <laughs> Imagine if this was like the untold history of like the Celtics. Yeah. <laughs> they never mentioned that the team had its start as a team of cryptids. That would be incredible. I would love to see a team of cryptids play basketball. Wow. I mean, they'd be insane. Bigfoot on defense? <laughs> they're all pretty big. Yeah, they're all very large. spring heel Jack? <laughs> <laughs> Dunking it like he's got flubber on? <laughs> Who would be the worst? Nassie? <laughs> we Dies immediately at the first a, whistle blow. 200 feet long dead <laughs> sea beast onto a 100 foot court. I mean, it's a distraction tactic, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, no evidence. However... One researcher on this topic 
looked at records since records began from Alberta and the surrounding provinces and came across a curious photo from the late 1800s. I'm going to show this photo to you. Okay. Notice anything weird? Uh, no. Is there some... I mean, so uh, we're looking at a picture of two men here. I mean, mm -hmm. they look weird because it's an old, creepy photo anyway. Right. It's it's uh, one of those photos before smiles were invented. Right. No one knew had a smile yet. Very, yeah, very grim looking. Mm -hmm. The gentleman on the left is holding some sort... Is that a chain? or a... It is a chain, actually. Okay. Well, the gentleman that came across this wouldn't have necessarily thought it was that weird either. Except the caption or the information alongside this mentioned... The murder and cannibalism of an entire family. Jesus. Which definitely sounds Wendigo-like, so he wanted to investigate further. It also explains the lack of smiles. Yes. That would be very inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> and indeed, as it transpired, the most famous case in the history of Wendigo history is not about a 15-foot beast, but a Native American man named Swift Runner, or Kaki Sikuchin. Also perfect for the basketball team. <laughs> Swift runner and spring-heeled Jack going downtown. The man in that photo was arrested for the murder and cannibalism of his wife, mother, brother, and six children. Wait, the guy holding the chain? Mm-hmm. He had been one of the Northwest Mounted Police and was respected in the Saskatchewan area. However, once respected, he was also known as basically a drunk. He had a fondness of whiskey and was described as an ugly customer to meet when on a spree. A cannibal spree? Not yet. Right. Some called him the terror of the whole region, but bearing in mind at this point he's still a policeman, so it's that's the context here. Yeah. I mean, a policeman shouldn't be described no, that as makes the it terror worse, of the whole region, <laughs> granted. Unless it's like a town of pirates or something. <laughs> Eventually, he was basically excommunicated from his town and he moved into the woods with his wife, mother, brother, and six children. Right. And the police started to hear disturbing tales about him. One of the Cree chiefs, one of the, one of the tribes of uh, North America, said that Swift Runner had become cannibal. And it wasn't long until Swift Runner turned himself into the police but he told them that his wife had committed suicide and the rest of his family had died of starvation. But having heard these previous stories, the officers noticed that Swift Runner didn't actually look very starved himself. Right. Which is a bit of a giveaway. He was a six foot three guy. If there's a lack of food there, he's going to start showing it. He's a tall guy, he's going to start going gaunt. He didn't look it. Absolutely. Six three though, he could probably dunk. <laughs> No, irrelevant, but just I'm drafting, so. Completely amoral, awful, disgusting to even bring up, but it is draft season. It is, yeah. You ever heard of the Fantasy League? Well, this is about as f***ing fantasy as it gets. <laughs> I'm drafting cryptids. We need to start that like a like a fantasy league at where you can choose any man or beast alive or dead, <laughs> fictitious or real. That'd be so great. It's like on defense, I've got Lincoln. <laughs> Because I trust them. <laughs> Offense, I've got Anthrax, the drug. <laughs> and my ref is Optimus Prime because he's a damn good leader. <laughs> and also he can shoot missiles and shit. It's going to be great. <laughs> Police were, of course, suspicious of, of this entire story. So they traveled with Swift Runner to his family's camp in the wilderness outside Saskatchewan. And they unfortunately did eventually find the remnants of his family by a campfire Ugh. piles of bones and remains scattered nearby some of the bones were hollowed out even empty of marrow oh and so, so what are we saying we're saying that this guy is the wendigo basically he's exhibiting very wendigo like behavior and right we haven't yet got to the bottom of what happened okay he was sentenced to hanging and this was actually the first legal hanging in alberta the first hanging in history in Alberta was of a alleged Wendigo. I mean, fair. <laughs> That's a good reason to hang someone. 
in the courts, they had white settlers, they had First Nations people that could speak English. And so kind of uh, running the gamut of the old tribal oral traditions and what they understood as Wendigo behavior. Right. And then the, I guess, like French settlers and English settlers who were just, <laughs> were like, this is just murder. Right, right. And we need to kill this person right away. I mean, they're both on the same page, at least. They're kind of on the same page, yeah. definitely. Swift Runner was given the option to spend the night before his execution with a priest. But he said... The white man has ruined me. I don't think their god would amount to much. Plus, I'm not that hungry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the priest is probably relieved. Yeah, he's like, thank you, shit. Oh, uh, good evening, father. Uh, yeah, let's just see, let's see where we are tonight. Oh, nice gentleman down, down the block here. Uh, swift runner. Oh, he sounds like a nice guy. Athletic. Yeah. That's all. He's healthy. In for uh, multiple cannibalism. Anyway, so you're just third cell on the right. Uh, yeah. Cannibal. <laughs> Sorry, just thinking about it. That's like the last person that you'd want to be put in a jail cell with. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, if someone's arrested for stabbing someone or dealing drugs, that's one thing. But a cannibal, their weapon is their mouth. Yeah. They can, they can commit their crime again with you in that room. And if they're a little cannibal, like a little child cannibal... You could probably just like, you know, do that thing like in the movies. You put your hand on the forehead, yeah. keep them like they're they're swinging their little claws at you. Yeah. But you're just keeping them back. He could probably keep that up for a few hours. But this guy's six foot three. And he's a swifty ass runner. He's a swift runner. He's and got a Jordan man. Ayers on. I don't know why they didn't take him off about him. That, but. He's a goddamn cop. So you know, he's fast. What are you like a chubby little priest? You don't stand a chance. <laughs> they just put a little piggy in there, basically. They lock the door. The second that happens, he's going at you. You manage to jab your Bible in between his jaws just to keep that thing from slamming shut on your freaking head. I mean, can you Chucking holy water in his eyes can trying you to get him off. imagine the, the disappointment whenever you're faced with certain death and then your cross and holy water, they don't burn anyone. They don't, they don't defend as well as they do in the movies. Yeah, because then the, the whole thing is like, you know, then in the mornings... They're like, oh, is everything okay? He's like, no, I had to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, the cross didn't work. The water didn't work. It's like, that was a test. And that's because the power of God is inside of you. <laughs> or the executioner's like, all I know is someone in this cell is going to die today. <laughs> You're coming with me. The worst judicial system ever. <laughs> <laughs> they find the prisoner dead in the morning and they're like, there's been a murder. It's like, you were literally going to kill him. <laughs> the execution had been ordered to take place at 7.30 a.m. on December 20th, 1879. But right before the execution was supposed to take place, <laughs> it turned out that the hangman forgot to bring straps to bind Swift Runner's arms down. Okay. As the hangman and the sheriff and everyone rushed and scrambled to get the thing ready, Swift Runner was sat down, apparently joking, snacking and chatting with a noose hanging around his neck. And he said, I could kill myself with a tomahawk and save the hangman further trouble. That's a pretty badass thing to say, though, to Pretty be fair. wild. Yeah. I mean, that didn't really have any implication for the story. I just thought it was a cool story. It is, it's a pretty cool line, yeah. <laughs> and that day, he was executed by hanging. Some say Swift Runner had developed a taste for cannibalism when he was forced to eat the remains of a starved hunting partner. But others say he was possessed by a Wendigo. Oh, so he's not the actual Wendigo. Yes, but it seems to be the, the crucial piece of the story is that the Wendigo can possess and can cause people to commit these ungodly acts. Right. And so, in that sense, these brutal cannibal murders do fit into the story of the Wendigo. He was outcast from his community, was living with his family, but he was only, I believe, a handful of miles away from the nearest, like, trading post and places he could get food and those things. Right. So it was not out of necessity whatsoever. Okay. It's kind of a similar case that we saw with the Slender Man, mm -hmm. where a lot of the time he wouldn't actually do anything to people, yes. but he would take people under his control and then uh, act out his evil deeds through the vessels that he had taken control of. A very Charles Manson approach. Yeah. But for the longest time, these tribes were used to handling Wendigo problems in their own way. And it was only like we see in this case with the arrival of policing did these murders actually enter history. I love it that like 
the police have set up their communities here. It's now a lawful society. A cannibal's running through the streets, eating people, and everyone's <laughs> like, all right, folks, you know what to do? They're all putting on their dancing shoes and getting their festival stuff ready, and the cops are like, what, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> We're doing the, the dance, the go-away dance. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> we brought guns. We could shoot him. Um, yeah, you're, yeah, you're right. Okay, that sounds good. Can we, can we still do the dance, though? It feels weird if we don't do the dance if, if you're going to shoot him. They do a full, like, 30 minutes of dance ending with that. He's angers. eaten 20 more people in this time as well. Conga line. Conga line and yeah. he's just picking them off one by one. <laughs> he just bends around into his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> one OG Cree chief and his brother were arrested in Canada in 1907 for the murder of 14 people. They claimed that they were Wendigo hunters and that the people they'd killed were all either Wendigos or on the verge of becoming Wendigos. They were genuine native medicine men and were respected for their powers of fighting supernatural evil. Sadly, when they were arrested, um, one of them committed suicide pretty quickly and the other died in custody. Ah, oh, that's grim. But it gives you the sense of, like you say, what was happening previous to this, that tribes had dedicated wendigo hunters that's insane who took care of wendigos that's dangerous very dangerous that's... especially when the criteria for wendigo <laughs> is it's like a minority report style you ha you don't have to have killed anyone yet you could just be a little quirky yeah yeah <laughs> just like do you guys smell blueberries <laughs> <laughs> it's better if we do this early <laughs> It's kind of scary. It's a lot like um, we saw with the Bloody Mary case uh, and the like, even like the Salem witch trials. You're looking at these small, very highly religious, guarded and isolated communities. Yeah. That getting a bit stir crazy. Rumors spread. Legends are told. You know, stories go get passed around the town and then people take things way too far. Yeah. And that's what it sounds like is happening. A lot like these witch trials. We're hearing about Wendigo trials. Definitely. And I mean, that's still kind of the way the world works. We kind of, people that do really bad things, we put them away for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And if you do slightly bad things, we kind of put you away for a little bit of time just yes. to see that you don't do anything bad again. The only difference is the severity of the punishment. We don't just instantly kill you the moment you like shoplift a chocolate bar. Yeah, it went from... Nowadays, it's like a little bit of jail time, a lot of jail time. Mm -hmm. Olden days, it was hanging or tomahawk to the back <laughs> of the head. That was minimal, <laughs> minimal punishment. We've decided to let you off on a hanging. Um, and they're like, oh, thank God. <laughs> yeah, just don't let it happen again. <laughs> Being somehow possessed by a Wendigo or being a Wendigo was a type of condition. And this would come out in the form of rage, insanity, and ultimately, if it went unchecked, cannibalism. Whilst it's pretty believable that this was part of kind of a First Nations people's history, maybe the craziest thing is that it entered kind of the lexicon and the lives of people in the modern age as well. There were multiple cannibal scares as a result of this in the 19th and 20th century. Wendigo incidents were reported in newspapers in Canada throughout the 1890s and early 1900s. For example, in 1897, two women were brought to a missionary for treatment after one of them had a dream of her brother offering her human flesh to eat. Both of them became sick afterwards and were believed to be Wendigos, like undergoing transformation oh, into right, Wendigo. Yeah. In 1899, two men were arrested and put on trial for murdering a man who had been possessed by a Wendigo. The afflicted man had apparently asked them to kill him before he killed them and they had done so. Then they asked them to take his wallet and his freaking car because he knows he won't need them as a Wendigo. <laughs> this sounds like if you killed anyone in the late 18th century, this was just a viable excuse to kind of get you off the hook. You know, you go to work one day and you're like, you know what, I, I don't like Dan. Dan's a bit of an ass. He's rude to me in the elevator. And uh, This is very real because you work very closely with Dan. You know, he's rude to me. He always makes fun of me in meetings and stuff. Okay, that's, uh, that's not a nice thing to do. I'm sure. going to kill him and right. say he's a Wendigo. Apparently that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in 1899, maybe. Right. And now? What would they say now? Bad. Right. Bad, wrong, don't do it. Okay. What if I've already done it? 
Hypothetically. Really? Yeah. Just a hypothetical. Hypothetically speaking. Okay. Your clothes have blood on them. Yeah. That's yeah, not Dan's. Really? That's Adam's. <laughs> he was mean to me in the toilet. <laughs> he pissed on my shoes by accident. He was now the last he's... person to tell me I couldn't kill Dan. <laughs> <laughs> AKA not believe in me. Little Wendingo ass. <laughs> I gotta go to court and the judge is just like... There's no point in having a trial at all. You clearly murdered them. There is CCTV footage. And like under my breath, I don't know why, there's like a mic plugged in. You little Wendigo asshole. <laughs> I'm going to kill you so hard, judge. <laughs> we can all hear you. <laughs> Super loud and breathy. <laughs> you little Wendigo piece of shit. You just wait till I'm out of these cuffs and no get a tomahawk. Remorse. Absolutely no remorse. You're never getting out. I'm sorry, all right? I didn't mean to kill them. Or I didn't kill them. <laughs> <laughs> Defense lawyer comes over to console you and you try to take a swipe at him. <laughs> Y'all assholes better start dancing because you got a Wendingo in the courtroom right now. So you're a Wendingo? I don't know anymore. <laughs> so basically, we were left with this confusing situation at the turn of the century where... It kind of summed up the culture clash of the old world and the new world that people were being killed and eaten by Wendigos, but simultaneously people were being prosecuted for murdering those Wendigos who had done crimes. Right, okay. Kind of the old style Wendigo hunters became vigilantes and were prosecuted, I guess. Another great This Paranormal Life episode involving renegade <laughs> vigilante hunters. <laughs> Which we couldn't support more people. Exactly. There's nothing more badass than that. This this more or less brings us to the end of the evidence portion of okay. the Wendigo tales. What do you th make of this case so far? I think it's really interesting. Obviously, any case set in this time period is going to be difficult. We've okay. tackled uh, previous cases around this time and always in the evidence section. <clears throat> it's a little light, <laughs> you know, a little brief, a little short. But does that mean it is definitely not true? Of course not. There's a grain of truth in everything. No smoke without fire. You believe it? It's real. <laughs> the catchphrase to the commune. Such a jump. <laughs> um, I think this is a tough one because on the one hand, we have the creature that you uh, introduced at the start, mm -hmm. which is, you know, this beast that's been told to be the Wendigo. Yeah, this, 15 foot tall. Exactly. This I can wrap my heads around. You know, you got these old civilizations, these old tribes, uh, and they have all these stories about creatures that live in the woods. And it's almost a method or a way of encapsulating a bad part of humanity. Right. There's a man in the woods. He likes to eat people. Mm. How do you dress that up? How do you tell people about it? Are you going to tell them, hey, Kevin eats humans? Mm. Or are you going to say, Kevin the Swiftfoot uh, is a creature known as a Wendigo? Mm. You know, it's a more colorful way of telling the story as it's passed down from group to group. And I think that's probably what's going on in the case of the beast. Yeah. Now, people being, I don't know, taken over? Possessed. Possessed, almost zombie-like? That's a whole different story. I'm interested to see what you think about that. It definitely seems convenient that there are not more sightings of the Wendigo. It definitely seems convenient that the Wendigo largely possesses people rather than carrying out the dirty work himself. Of course. I did try to find more research uh, on sightings of Wendigos, and there are not many, not from back in the day, although it was an oral tradition, so it's hard to trace. I did find one on Reddit, title, I saw the Wendigo when I was 12. <laughs> I'm excited. I was walking home with my parents after a long day at the zoo. It was midwinter, and there was heavy snow all over the ground. I saw large footprints in the snow shaped like those of a large bird. The only difference was the left toe was lifted off the ground. I pointed this out to my parents, but they said it was probably just someone in a dinosaur costume having a prank. A snowstorm broke out 20 minutes after we set out, and I said to my parents, we should be moving. This could be dangerous. My parents agreed. That's a piss take. No 12-year-old boy would say any of this. We took shelter in a subway. <laughs> Mother, father, winter is coming. We must seek <laughs> refuge. <laughs> No one talks like this. My dad eventually went out to see if it was safe. We heard a low reptilian growl and the sound of a bone snapping. <laughs> Papa? <laughs> Papa? We ran further down the subway, got into the train, and this is in New York City, by the way. <laughs> New York City in like 
2005. God. We jumped out at the next station, which was very near our house. Sorry, they left Dad. He shut the door, <laughs> locked it. I went straight to my bedroom. I shut the door. And just in case, I closed the blinds and barricaded the door. Only something supernaturally strong could push that, right? I was terribly wrong when I thought that. <laughs> I heard the front door smashing open and my, <laughs> and my mother screaming. They fo it followed them from the subway? <laughs> <laughs> it took the goddamn L train <laughs> across time. It cramped it, up it little beast. Took its like put his little ticket in the turnstile. <laughs> Whatever just attacked my mom pushed my door open with ease. Then I realized I had made a stupid mistake. I don't use light objects to barricade the door. <laughs> the creature in front of me had armor on its head resembling a deer skull with a crack on its snout. Its yellow eyes with slit pupils stared at me and I stared back. Its fur was stained with blood and I saw it holding an arm I recognized as my own father's <laughs> off. <laughs> the creature's gray figure began to move towards me. Without thinking, I grabbed a box and threw it at the creature. It fell backwards. I realized I had the upper hand. <laughs> no, you don't. I, <laughs> I took the curtain rail off the wall and charged at the creature. I kicked a box onto its head, disorienting it temporarily. When it regained full control of its body, I had already thrust the rail into its underbelly. The creature growled in anger, but eventually <laughs> went into what appeared to be a permanent state of unconsciousness. I ran downstairs to check my mom. I was relieved when she turned out to be okay. We went, both went upstairs. We both went upstairs to check the creature, but it had vanished. So, that's the story. I'm gonna relax now and try to forget that incident. I love that it starts off with him just being like, like I'm, I'm gonna try and recall what I saw that day. <laughs> It's like, your dad died. Like, either this did or it didn't happen. You knocked out a beast. <laughs> like, you didn't forget this happens. <laughs> I love how Freudian this is about yeah. his dad getting killed by this beast, but his mom being fine. And he yeah. gets to live forever, just him and his mom. And I actually save my mom and she loves me because I'm the best boy ever. <laughs> I'm actually the man of the house after that because I killed the beast. Um, cool. Very convincing. So that's one sighting of the Wendigo. But unfortunately, after that, there's very little sightings of the Wendigo. It is all possessions, all cannibal murders throughout history. Right. As always on this podcast, we do have to come to a decision as to whether the tale of the Wendigo is paranormal or not. If you have to make that decision, Rory, what are you thinking? Well, the the story about a beast living in the woods, giant, grows stronger as it ages, and can manipulate people, eat human flesh, has no lips, that is definitely paranormal. Unfortunately, that is the part of the story that I believe is untrue. Now, the other aspect is humans out in the woods eating and murdering each other. Mm -hmm. That's definitely the part that I believe has and continues to happen. Right. But that is the part that I also think is unfortunately not paranormal. So I think this week in terms of the Wendigo, the Wendigo, Lake Wendigo, and all the Wendigados, it is going to be a no for me this week, unfortunately. Even if we scrap the whole Wendigo physical beast, there is definitely a bizarre and creepy tale there of people seemingly with no motivation whatsoever going completely insane. And the fact that this is journaled in, in newspapers and, and magazines throughout history for hundreds of years is very disturbing. This even entered sort of medical dictionaries for a time, Wendigo psychosis. Jesus Christ. But as you say, the definition of Wendigo psychosis entered the dictionary. The Wendigo beast didn't enter the encyclopedia. Right. That was the never term discovered. used. Okay. And I think from that perspective, I agree, it's going to be a no on the case of the Wendigo. Damn, unfortunately, that's a double no. We're hitting another bit of a no dry spell, or a yes dry spell. Yeah. Unfortunately. I think we'll have to do something about that. Which is very, uh, you know, contrary to the, you believe it, it's real motto of the paranormal cult. Yeah, when push comes to shove, we're, we're a lot more conservative with that motto. Yeah, 
commune as well. I realize I said the <laughs> C word earlier. Oh, sorry. And it is definitely not a cult. Yes. No, couldn't be more clear about that. And I'm sorry I didn't flag that up when I heard yeah, you the first time. Unless you believe it's a cult. No. And it's real. Whoa. <laughs> If you have any of your own thoughts on the case of the Wendigo, you can send those to this paranormal life podcast at gmail.com. Absolutely love that story. And um, we've had a bunch of suggestions for doing the Wendigo. So thank you very much to Alexandra M, Joshua C, Ben S, Nicholas J O, <laughs> Joseph W, Shabazz S, Andy M. And there's probably more I'm missing, so I apologize. But thank you very much for everyone flagging up that hyper important case. As always, guys, remember we have socials you can catch up with us on. We're at twitter.com forward slash this para life, facebook.com forward slash this paranormal life. There's a secret society. You know, there's a lot of planning going on in there for the commune. Um, we're really, we're at sort of the, the, the last stages before launching at this point exactly um, the doors are almost open it's the, it's like that bit you know where uh you know in in willy wonka when the chocolate factory is going to be open for the first time mm-hmm. in like a billion years mm-hmm. and uh mr wonka himself comes out mm-hmm. but you know how he does that like prat fall where mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. he like does the fake roll and then he's totally fine mm-hmm. you know like you'll come out with a little walking stick right. then like do a tumble roll yep. pull out a crossbow shoot bigfoot and Bigfoot drops dead, and then I take off the mask, and it's me. And we're like, "Welcome to the paranormal cult commune." Shit. Yeah, not really a cult. Good. I'm gonna edit. I, we've said it so just many times. I'm gonna out. edit out. Just yeah. I thank really you. am. I really am. It's because it's getting my f-ing joke at this point. Being really bad. I feel like this is gonna come back to bite us in court. The inevitable court date. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you guys are obviously running a cult. You've said it a number of times in the podcast. You little wind dingo piece of <laughs> shit. <laughs> I'm going to kill you so bad. We can hear you, Powers. Everything is on the record. <laughs> there is a person typing every word that you say over there. When Dingo typing, <laughs> it's goddamn claws. If you want to support the podcast, you can do so on Patreon. That's right. We do not run advertisements on the pod. So the best way to support us is at patreon.com forward slash this paranormal life, where from $2 a month, you can get the research notes of every case, including the Wendigo case. Exactly. From five bucks, you can get bonus episodes. And above that, we have merchandise, other things. Because you know what, guys? People, you got you guys make money. We all make money. What are you going to do with that, huh? Five dollars. What is that going to get you? You save it up. You can buy some clothes. Right. Save it up enough. Deposit on a house, a car. Right, right, right. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe show show your family a nice time. Yeah, I guess it's like Mother's Day or something. You could buy her some flowers. You could do that. Yeah. You, you know could. what? Would, you know what? Show your mom a good goddamn time. You slap to earbuds in her ears and hit play on the bonus episode of This Paranormal Life at full volume. Give her the gift of woke this Christmas. Obviously. <laughs> Why waste your money on material objects when you could get knowledge, borderline facts? And also on that note, as we mentioned in a previous podcast, the t-shirts that we have, the $20, the Praise Rash shirts, are ending their limited time. We've actually had a, a cool like push of people trying to get shirts before they run out. So this is going to be the final reminder. Uh, if you do want a Praise Rash shirt, pick them up now because they're going and almost gone the end of every podcast we like to take the time to thank the people who support us on patreon by shouting them out right here in the podcast it's that time again here we are let's go thank you to lex kratzer lex please don't cast a hex on us here because with the last name like that you sound like you're from another goddamn planet probably has some sort of supernatural hexing ability uh, but we appreciate the support uh, whatever planet you're from so thank you very much indeed and i can see you have paid here in some sort of quantum crypto technology so i appreciate that thank you very much to jorge palma he actually submitted the uh, idea for the denver international airport story that was a great bonus episode and he's got us in the palma his hands oh that's right we are your humble servants and we accept any crumbs that fall off your kingly table sir you gonna wrap this next one (laughs) This guy's got a pretty good rap name. Thank you so much to Dr. Bustos. <laughs> you thought I was going to be able to drop in as soon as that, that info landed? 
Doctor what? Bustos. 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 Has he got a like a a, a medical degree, an MD ship? Um, much in the same way that Dr. Dre has. Is it a some sort of rap? Yeah, like a Do- rap doctorate? title. At the very least, I hope he has a bus pass for transport. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> well, um, either way, sir, we um, we assume that you are a, a doctor in your own right. Right. Uh, and we appreciate your scholarly input into, the, into this paranormal life. And we will be asking you to feel... Probably many, many medical questions that are life and death. Because when the commune gets firing, we'll need doctors on hand. Absolutely. (laughs) For what we've got planned? Yeah. Thank you to Julia Rose Wenger. Julia, did you go to school, Leah? Because you are smart enough to know a good podcast when you listen to one. That's why you chose this paranormal life. And we sure as hell appreciate it. Here's a rose. (laughs) (laughs) And we're, yeah, every every name. (laughs) Thank you to Noah Shreve. I know a guy named Shreve. <laughs> He's a solid dude. <laughs> I do not. Thank you, Noah Shreve, for your donation. And I know a lot of people uh, think about donating to this Patreon. And you actually had the balls to go through with it. So I don't just know a Shreve. I know a goddamn beast. Thank you to Chris Bolton. Chris, I hope you're planning on joining the Paranormal Commune because we're going to need someone who's going to be in charge of bolting the doors shut. That's right. We let people in and then we all stay in because the Paranormal Call Commune is so perfect. No one's ever going to want to leave. So just don't give them the option, Chris. Yeah. It's not about not letting people leave. It's just that they won't want to. So why Give them the possibility. Exactly. And remember, Bolton, we're all in this together. Yes, we are in this cult. I don't mean cult, I mean commune. We're all in this together. You and me and those candles oh. and that knife with a dagger. <laughs> cult heads everywhere. Didn't mean to say the word cult. Thank you to Kyle Bailey. Kyle donated. I barely know him. That was nice of him it's good thanks man uh kyle i got nothing to say to you you know you you know where we stand at the gates of hell together brother (laughs) that's right the only one brave enough to defect with me in world war ii you thought that shit was done hell no i've been in six more wars (laughs) ones you haven't even heard of ones that i defected from so fast i didn't even learn what the name was (laughs) why join why join the armed forces if you're gonna leave it must be insanely hard to defect escape punishment yeah then join the army again you think i escaped punishment (laughs) hell to the no i served my time on the front lines before defecting again (laughs) I'd scramble off and they'd just pick me back up and throw me in the field again. <laughs> the, way, the greatest punishment of all was just putting me back in the army. Thank you to James Bolt. The name's Bolt. James Bolt. Nice, man. That's good. Also, Bolt rhymes with cult. Which has nothing to do with anything. <laughs> Moving no. on. Alice Smomune. <laughs> rhymes with commune. Very oh. relevant. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, James. And thank you, lastly, but not leastly, to Ryan Burge. Crying Ryan, eh? Finally decides to show his face. I remember seeing the tear streaming down his face as we both defected from the front line. But he felt bad about it, unlike a real man who doesn't feel anything. What? Like me. No tears, no nothing. Yeah, but you don't feel any emotion at any other point in your life either. It's like a medical issue. That's right, baby. That's why I'm perfect for war. That's why they kept throwing me back in. I was the secret weapon. (laughs) Imagine the army breeding a super soldier over 50 years of genetic research. But this... all he does is defect. <laughs> he, he's, he, he's so emotionally cool. He just leaves. He's like, I am above this. <laughs> it's like, what? We made him too smart. He doesn't like war. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Do you imagine if just Captain America was obviously like super strong, super fast, lightning reflexes, but a coward? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like we couldn't make him brave. We could just make him strong. He's still afraid of guns. <laughs> 
We can do we can do the muscles, we can do the goddamn super strength, we can do the super speed. We can literally give you the heart of a lion, yeah. but you will not have the heart of the lion. No. No. Yeah. That's not how that works. You will, Trust you will me. have the heart of a cub. <laughs> a little baby cub. Well, that just about wraps it up for the shout-outs this week. If you haven't heard your name yet and you are a Patreon supporter, that is because your shout-out is yet to come. We're getting there. Thanks again for tuning in this week, folks. Hope you enjoyed the tale of the Wendigo. You can catch us next Tuesday for a brand new paranormal tale. And in the meantime, remember to live Live fast, fast, investigate, investigate, and die die young, young, baby. Boom! You believe it? It's real. Okay! (laughs) A little jump! (laughs) Oh, sure, oh, sure, oh, sure, oh, sure. (laughs) All right! (laughs) Uh, uh, uh.